Today we'll be talking about biogeochemical cycles, specifically the water cycle. And the goal of this video is to describe the steps of the water cycle and explain how humans have an impact on this process. Okay, so what is a biogeochemical cycle? It is a cycle that represents the movement of a particular form of matter through the living and non-living parts of an ecosystem. There are three main cycles that we will study water cycle, carbon cycle, and nitrogen cycle. Keep in mind, since matter can neither be created nor destroyed, and Earth is a closed system, these essential nutrients, water, carbon, nitrogen, they must be continuously cycled. All right, so let's talk about water. Water is H2O. That's two hydrogens and one oxygen. And water is necessary for the life processes of all living things. Water is found in several places. One is Earth's surface. This would include oceans, lakes, rivers, and so on. 97% of the water on Earth's surface is in the ocean. 3% is fresh water. And 2% is frozen in glaciers. Now, there's also w water underneath Earth's surface. This is called groundwater. Uh, it's in aquifers. There's also water in Earth's atmosphere, and there's water in living organisms like you and me. Now, the water cycle is driven by the sun. The sun is going to cause evaporation from reservoirs and evaporation from organisms. So now let's go through these steps of the water cycle. The first step is precipitation. This is when water falls to earth as a liquid, usually in the form of rain, sleet, or snow. Next comes infiltration. That's when some water seeps underground from the surface of the earth, and it accumulates in an aquifer. An aquifer is an underground layer of rock that can hold water. Then there's runoff. Runoff occurs when liquid water that isn't infiltrated, that, that's water that doesn't seep into the ground, uh, when that water instead runs along the surface of the earth and collects in bodies of water, that's how runoff occurs. And bodies of water in this case could be puddles, rivers, oceans, ponds, and so forth. Okay, so now you know about precipitation, infiltration, and runoff, but we haven't finished the cycle yet Next comes evaporation. Evaporation is when the sun heats liquid water and it becomes a vapor that rises into the atmosphere. Closely related to this is transpiration. This is when water rises back into the atmosphere, but the water comes from plants. Then there's also condensation. Condensation is when water vapor condenses to form clouds before precipitating again. Okay, so now we've talked about all six steps of the water cycle. Keep in mind that all organisms take in water for nutrient transport, chemical reactions, and diffusion. And this means they have to eliminate water too. So they can't just take in water and never get rid of any. They have to get rid of it. And for us, we release it in the form of urine and in our feces. Now there's two processes that we need to keep in mind that water is closely related to. And we'll talk much more in depth about both of these processes later in this course. The first is cellular respiration. So all organisms release water when breaking down food for energy. And that happens in this process called cellular respiration. Plants also take in water. And this process where they take in water and use it to make sugar, that's called photosynthesis. And you can see the water in the equation for cellular respiration and the equation for photosynthesis. We'll finish this video by talking about human impact on the water cycle. There are several ways that humans can negatively impact the environment. One of them is deforestation. 
Another is paving or building or developing new roads, bridges, buildings, and so forth. Another is pollution. We can pollute the water. And then the last is eutrophication. That's when a body of water becomes overly enriched with nutrients and it causes excessive algae growth. Now, we need to say more about how exactly these can negatively impact the water cycle. So let's start with deforestation. In deforestation, you're cutting down trees, plants, and so on, and that's automatically going to decrease the amount of transpiration that's happening because now there are no more plants for water vapor to leave and go back up into the atmosphere from. And that's what's happening in transpiration. In the case of paving roads and building new buildings and bridges and so forth, that's going to increase the amount of runoff because the streets that you make or the bridge that you make or so on is going to cause more water to um, not seep into the ground, but instead run off uh, into some body of water. In the case of pollution, it's very common that people dispose of waste or our waste ends up in water. Uh, and so that's going to impact the water cycle. When it comes to eutrophication, there's an interesting story going on here. So the extra nutrients that end up in the body of water cause, uh, cause a lot of algae to grow. But those algae block light from getting into the water. And if light can't get into the water, then the plants inside the water can't do photosynthesis because they don't have sunlight. But then if those plants aren't doing photosynthesis, they can't produce oxygen. But if they can't produce oxygen, then the other animals that need the oxygen will be negatively impacted. And so many of those organisms are going to die because of a lack of oxygen. And decomposers start to break them down, but then the decomposers start using oxygen as well. And that just further depletes the amount of oxygen that's available. And so that's how eutrophication can negatively impact the organisms living in a body of water. To sum up then, we've seen in the steps of the water cycle, and we've seen several ways that humans can negatively impact the water cycle.